motion to open, or to, I'm sorry, to adjourn, rather, the uh, September term. So uh, All those in favor? Aye. Uh, and is there a motion to open the uh, October term? So moved. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, will the bailiff please open the court? All right. That is coming from Mr. Court is now in session for October 2013 term with Honorable Judge J.P. presiding. Please remain standing for the invitation. We'll tell you what, when he is here, doing that, it's like home field. I feel like he is playing at home. He is uh, doing that. So, but, but all of y'all are great. All the security that does that is great. Um, to to uh, today, uh, the invitation will be given by guests. Uh, uh, Commissioner Garcia. Thank you, Judge, colleagues, members of the audience. It's my honor today to have Pastor Andrew Jackson give the invocation. Pastor Andrew Jackson Jr. is the second oldest of his six children, born in Chicago, Illinois, and grew up in Memphis, Tennessee. Pastor Jackson is a graduate of the University of Memphis and holds a Bachelor of Business Administration in Marketing. Pastor Jackson worked for Delta Airlines for 29 years, where he served in several positions of leadership. He retired in 2006 to dedicate his time to his family and to the ministry. He continued further studies in Christian education and evangelism at Mid-South Bible School in Memphis, Tennessee, and completed the Billy Brown School of Evangelism. Pastor Jackson has been an ordained minister since 1975 and has been the pastor of West Irving Church of God in Christ in Irving uh, since 1998. The ministry provides weekly tutoring sessions, computer literacy classes, youth mentoring programs, and outreach initiatives that reach out and serve the Irving and Dallas Fort Worth area. Pastor Jackson believes in building strong families to the power of God. The ministry also feeds and provides housing for the homeless, ministers for the abuse, and conducts monthly worship services at uh, an Irving nursing home. He and his wife Sandra have been married for almost 35 years and um, they have two sons, one daughter and one daughter-in-law. They are also the proud grandparents of one granddaughter and one grandson. Pastor Jackson, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you for the invitation. Let us pray. Our Father, my God, we thank you this morning for your grace. Thank you for your mercies that are renewed every day. We pause this morning even to remind ourselves that it is God that giveth us the power to gain wealth. Even in our critical situation our nation is facing, we yet know where God guides, He provides. We pray your blessings upon this morning, this court, this judge, these commissioners, as decisions are made that will benefit not only them but the constituencies of this city. At the helm that they reign and the, the, the services that they render will foremost come to serve our citizens. We pray, God, that the leadership of this town, this city, our nation will find themselves seeking God for counsel. We thank you, Lord, for the citizens of Dallas. We thank you, Lord, for these leaders of Dallas, our city fathers, that make rules and laws that will govern us. We pray that the hand of the king be in the hand of God. Bless us, Lord, we pray. Everything we do, we will honor you. And we ask these many choice blessings in your precious name. And the people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, good morning on the first day of the new fiscal year. Uh, this resolution is dealing with cybersecurity, so if, if the people most knowledgeable about this would please uh, come forward, I would really appreciate that. The resolution reads, whereas we recognize the vital role and technology as in our daily lives, whereby citizens, schools, libraries, businesses, governmental entities, and other organizations that utilize the internet for keeping in contact with family and friends, managing personal finances, performing research, 
enhancing education and conducting business all of our lives, whereas critical sectors are increasingly reliant on information systems to support financial services, energy, telecommunications, transportation, utilities, healthcare, and emergency response systems. Have you forgotten anything in this list? No. <laughs> Techno whereas technology provides new opportunities for economic growth, and free exchange of information around the world, and it also provides for the increasing threat of malicious cyber attacks, loss of privacy from spyware and adware, and significant financial and personal privacy losses due to identity theft and fraud. And whereas the month of October is National Cybersecurity Awareness Month, which encourages vigilance and protection by all com computer users. Therefore, governmental entities must work closely together to reduce risk and build resilience in their shared critical information and communication infrastructure. And citizens must be proactive and responsible in their role to secure the cyber networks used every day. And whereas information sharing to provide a collaborative mechanism to help states and local governments enhance cybersecurity. And Dallas County provides a comprehensive approach to help enhance the security at this level of government. And whereas the Dallas County Information Technology Department will provide a broadcast email each Tuesday and Thursday during the month of October to heighten awareness and educate employees about cybersecurity and host an IT security awareness event for the local, for the area local governments. And whereas the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, um, the Multi-State Information Sharing and Political Center and the National Association of State Chief Information Officers have declared October as National Cyber Security Awareness Month and all citizens are encouraged <coughs> to visit these sites to learn about cybersecurity and put knowledge into practice in their home, school, workplace, and businesses. It is there, therefore ordered, adjudged, and decreed that the Dallas County Commissioner's Court approves and hereby proclaims the month of October 2013 as National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Do I hear a motion? I so agree. And thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much. Um, the computer world and cyberspace is something that affects absolutely every last piece of county government. So what do you have to say about this, Mr. Jones? Certainly first, uh, we want to thank Commissioner Dr. Daniels for sponsoring the resolution of cybersecurity month, as well as of course there is an option. Uh, certainly, uh, Major, yes. I, I know you made an assumption that everybody knows who you are. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Uh, I am an outstanding victim. I'm the uh, Chief Information Officer for the Great County of Dallas. And uh, certainly, I want to again thank the uh, Commissioner Dr. Davis for uh, sponsoring the resolution, as well as the courts for its adoption. Uh, certainly, in the old days where we typically had a physical adversary, I think everybody would typically be able to draw and basically you know, kind of act accordingly. But now, uh, Nowadays, people don't basically come at us basically you know, just via some kind of physical approach, basically come at us via And just to make that pronounced, I would just like everybody to typically that uses a computer or a smartphone to raise your hand. You're, you're subject to, you're subject to uh, being uh, attacked in the cyber. You know, I did I think it's commissioner talk about. And I think it's just basically important to be basically be aware of the that are actually out there. And with that, I was going to ask that Randy Gwynn, the county IT uh, the private security officer, will kind of come up and talk to us about some of the things that typically going on this month. Thank you very much. Mr. Graham. Good. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's, when you think about cybersecurity, you've got to have a look at the history of it. You know, back, back in the 90s, it was all learned with viruses and you know, my computer, my network's going to blow, blow up, go down. You don't hear those stories anymore, and that's because cybersecurity has changed. But it's not about destruction, it's about criminal activity. Uh, data has value, they figured it out, 
and most of the cyber uh, malicious code you see running around in the networks today, these days is either coming from organized crime or from government. Uh, and uh, just to give you some examples, you may have heard a couple of years ago, RSA uh, security company that uses a uh, code for authentication that there are many years they were market leader in that. They were compromised. That's a, a known story. What a lot of people really don't know behind the scenes is that was supposedly driven by another government to compromise that. Once that was compromised, what they they were taking the proprietary information that they got, they used that to compromise Lockheed Martin and get military information on some aircraft that went under construction. So uh, very serious stuff. Uh, more recently, last year, this, this was interesting to me because working in the security role, I've seen lots and lots of emails and warnings come out that last September, the financial sector was going to be under attack. It, it, it was just out there, everybody knew about it, and with all the efforts that financial people put in place, it was still a very successful attack for the bad guys. Bank of America, J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo, Citigroup, BNC Bank, all you know, it was a, a, a pretty bad deal. It was a bad time to be in the financial sector, and that still continues. Uh, and even more interestingly than that is uh, they breached some of the nation's most advanced computer defenses and exposed vulnerabilities there. So bad guys are real and they're real bad. Uh, a little more recently, and I think one everybody can relate to, is uh, phishing emails. Uh, that's, that's something not specific to Dallas County, but it's an ongoing uh, battle, I'd say, that we, we fight against. And a lot of these you've seen are, uh, you, they'll, they'll be like this from the email ad, and you'll get an email that's from the IT department. But Matt, I think one we haven't seen here, but it, it highlights uh, to what extent these bad guys will go to. Uh, there's one that goes around that's from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. And they have a duplicated that website, and you know, it's not getting money. But uh, I think that's pretty, you know, these guys have no more ethics when they stick that low. And then, uh, of course, uh, social media. That's uh, uh, another just a, a really prime area that they focus on and they were straight out just recently one of our elected officials had his Facebook page duplicated. Who took that was already communicating with uh, other people and I'm sure if that is allowed to stay in place, uh, they've been asking for a campaign funds or something like that. That was mine so if you received an email. <laughs> <laughs> So we appreciate this opportunity to, to acknowledge Cybersecurity Awareness Month and as we've done in the last couple of years, each Tuesday and Thursday we'll be sending out a broadcast email that just has a, a, some kind of IT security way uh, to, to promote awareness. Uh, this is catching on, even though this is I believe the 11th year for the nation to do this, it, it, uh, there's quite a few local events going on so we'll be promoting them as well. And then we've had events the last two years and this year so we added Swift, so thank you to them for hosting this for us. Uh, they had a nice facility. Uh, and I'm happy to say uh, I have an individual name is Mr. Ricardo Martinez. Uh, he's a principal partner in Axiom Global Services, which is a cybersecurity company that's on the suburban. But uh, he's worked directly with the Israeli cybersecurity and their uh, defense forces uh, on some discrete projects that were focused on battlefield cyber counterintelligence. A uh, very interesting individual. He's also a board member of the National Health Care Information <coughs> Analysis Center, the National <coughs> Cyber Security Research Center, and the U.S. National Cyber Security Council. He's also certified in cyber, comprehensive cyber terrorism defense. <coughs> Company security training that something that less than 800 people have been certified in, in the last six years. Uh, very interesting individual, and we're we'll be sending out invites and flyers on that. So. We look, uh, we appreciate everybody's attendance to that. And once again, I just want to thank everybody. And again, uh, thank you, Commissioner, for the response to the resolution as well as the Christmas breakfast. Certainly, we want everybody to be on that.
also my good friend and the uh, Democratic Party Chair, uh, Darwin Ewing, is, is here with us uh, this morning. And, Are you? Uh, and my good friend, Ray Hutchison. So we're very honored to have uh, those <coughs> guests with us this morning. Uh, the next two resolutions are from Commissioner Kenneth uh, I have two resolutions that we presented at a later time. One is the retirement for Tom Carroll. I move this adoption. Always in favor. Uh, second is for Michael Pack Industries, which is the 50th anniversary of the presented at a later date. I move this adoption. Second. Always in favor. Aye. Aye. Uh, our final resolution today is from Commissioner Price. Commissioner Price. No, I beg your pardon, uh, Commissioner uh, Garcia. Uh, I'll, yeah, I'll get you. <coughs> well, Judge uh, Commissioner, we're very fortunate today to have on this uh, first day of what they call open enrollment the University of North Texas Health Science Center. Uh, Dr. Curtis is here, who is the dean of the School of Public Health and Convalor. Kim Lanier, who is the Associate Director of the University of North Texas Health Science Center for Community Health. And of course, she's a member of the Dallas Chapter of the Cancer Disparities Communities Coalition. And there are Utah Project staff is here, so I'm going to ask them all to just kind of come forward. Dean Curtis was named uh, by the Dallas Business Journal as one of this year's 25 honorees for the publication Who's Who? in health care awards. He was selected as a leader who is making a significant impact on North Texas health care industry through what we call innovative work. The uh, UN Health Science Center for Community Health Projects and Community uh, and Engagement Profile is before my colleagues here. Uh, there's also the synergy of the 2013 annual research report uh, on page 22 where breast cancer is highlighted in the prevention project. And uh, October is Breast Cancer Awareness <coughs> Month. 28% of the women ages 18 to 64 are uninsured in Dallas County with five zip codes of particular concern. 75210, 79% of the women are uninsured. 75215, 75% of the women are uninsured. 75216, 75% of the women are uninsured. 75232, 34% of the women are uninsured, and 75241, 58% of the women are uninsured. Currently, it is estimated that 5,500 people are living with breast cancer in Dallas County. Only 62% of the women residing in Dallas County adhere to the screening guidelines of age 40 plus having an annual mammogram. This program that we honor today works with the community throughout Dallas County, including those designated noted zip codes to educate the women and reduce breast cancer disparities in Dallas County. So the resolution reads that whereas one in eight women in America will be diagnosed with breast cancer in her lifetime, and whereas there are striking differences in the cancer incident prevalence and mortality within racial and ethnic minority and poor populations in this nation, and whereas Dallas County has a higher age-adjusted breast cancer mortality rate when compared to the U.S. rate for both African American and Hispanic women and our adjusted, age-adjusted cancer death rates in South Dallas, which is 31% higher than the Dallas County average rate of 49%. 
and that's part of the Dallas County Northern Carter region. Whereas 37% of African American women are diagnosed with breast cancer in the late stages of the disease, compared to only 28% of non Hispanic whites. And whereas University of North Texas Health Science Center, Center for Community Health, recognized the need to address these disparities and convene the Dallas Cancer Disparities Coalition. And whereas UNT Health Science Center recognizes values and engages in partnerships through the Dallas Cancer Disparities Coalition with esteemed community stakeholders, hospitals, national health affiliates, as well as community and faith-based organizations to implement a community-based participatory research approach through breast cancer prevention, education, and screening program. And whereas 30% of the women involved with the Dallas Cancer Disparities Coalition program have never had a mammogram before entering the program. And women engaged in the Dallas Cancer Disparities Coalition program have experienced an abnormal cancer rate four times that of the national average. Whereas the program provides access to breast cancer education and screening for all participants since its inception, regardless of their ability to pay, and has touched thousands of women through their outreach and presentation. Now, therefore, be it resolved, decreed that Dallas County Commissioner's Court is hereby commend the impactful and effective work of the UNT Health Science Center Dallas Cancer Disparities Coalition through their extensive efforts in Dallas County to raise awareness of breast cancer prevention, resulting in increased access to breast cancer screening and education especially for a high risk women residing in Dallas County and the ISO Second. All those in favor? Aye. Dean? I just want to uh, briefly thank you all for uh, this recognition for a very, very important program. Certainly, I uh, want to thank uh, Commissioner Price and all the members uh, of the Commissioner's Court for uh, giving us this opportunity to highlight something that's going on in your community that uh, is an important thing and that is uh, it's an auspicious day to do that, given that today is the first day of uh, Obamacare, when folks have an opportunity to uh, gain insurance who may not have insurance at this time. Uh, insurance is certainly an important part of giving people an opportunity to seek and to continue their care. Uh, but it is also important for programs like this one to be available to the community to make people aware of the need to go forward with the kinds of prevention uh, and promotion of their health that uh, is so essential uh, uh, in today's world where we see more and more um, um, poor health resulting from um, smoking, from uh, obesity and other kinds of behaviors that uh, lead to this poor health. This morning uh, we have with us um, a number of the individuals who are a part of this program. Uh, not the least of those certainly is uh, Skip Lanier. She's uh, offered just tremendous leadership to this program over the last uh, seven years since it's uh, started. Uh, also want to mention Dr. Katie Cardarelli who um, has left the university to go to a job at another university, but who was the leader in starting this program and shouldn't go without mention this morning, but also all the other folks who are with us who, who have offered leadership to this program and who have made it possible in your community and made it uh, possible for us to expand this program uh, in this community and hopefully get to expand it to other communities as well. We feel that it's just a tremendous model that should be recognized nationally for what it does. Uh, I represent the School of Public Health at the University of North Texas Health Science Center. We view the school as the uh, Health Science Center, certainly, as well as the School of Public Health for the Metroplex. Um, we have lots of uh, programs that are developing at the Health Science Center, a new program in pharmacy, which is one of the first uh, that is in the Health Science Center, actually, and not an independent pharmacy program, so we're very proud of that. 
but we hope that this is just the start of our opportunities to work with you and the other institutions here in Dallas to do health prevention and uh, health promotion on a number of areas that are concerns to you and concerns to us and concerns to all of the citizens of the Metroplex. Uh, this is uh, an area that no one group, no one individual, no one entity can do alone. Uh, we can only do it by collaboration among institutions, governmental, educational, uh, health, and, and beyond. Uh, and so we thank you this morning again for giving us the opportunity to come and have some recognition for a very important program, but to indeed recognize the fact that this is an activity of your community um, <coughs> that has worked very successfully and that with that kind of collaboration, we can do a great deal more. So thank you very much uh, again, Mr. Wiley and, and the court for all of this recognition. Dean, uh, I'm, I'm going to ask each one of the delegation to <coughs> introduce themselves. Will the paramedics please check us out the Look, um, that's, a, that's, that's a family joke. He, he knows. Uh, there's a couple of things. First of all, a lot of these zip codes are to, the, to, to my um, female colleagues uh, that one would probably think uh, we don't talk about men in terms of breast cancer. Uh, and none of these individuals are part of my District 3 Public Health Advisory. Uh, that's, that's number one. Number two, a lot of these zip codes within my district are the most impactful. One other thing, Dean, you did not <coughs> say that the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, affords is people with pre-existing <coughs> conditions. And when you talk about, unfortunately, my, my, my community, my community, and Dallas, there are a number of people with pre-existing conditions. And if the exchange does nothing else to better, those individuals cannot be denied an opportunity to acquire insurance. And so, uh, again, I thank you for the tremendous work, the engagement, the collaboration. Some people didn't play around with that. <coughs> Now, while I know you've gone after a number of grants, uh, I said about a, a dedication on the street on um, Saturday where um, Senator West and I were, uh, it's, it's one thing to talk about it when the insurance is available. It's another thing when that's not the incentive. That's what we talked about Saturday with an individual who had a re-entry program before re-entry was possible. They were providing housing, they were doing the re-entry. You've been doing the same thing before October 1st, 2013 got And so I, I just thank you. I, I see your people, I see them in the community, on the ground, six, seven days a week. In churches on Sunday, I see them. On Saturdays, urban league places, I see them. I see them. So your people have boots on the ground. So I, I just want to say thank you for assuming that call. Thank you again. Uh, we should also uh, certainly thank a large part of the uh, funding came from CBRIC, from the, the state's cancer program. Uh, we're very pleased to see that that's getting uh, hopefully straightened out and, and we'll be able to see funds there again because those are important funds for us to carry forward uh, on this work. Uh, I would also, if it's possible, let each of the folks behind me to loudly recognize, say their names and recognize their agency. Cheryl Roseboro, the Dallas Housing Authority. Good morning. Cheryl Boss with Vice President of Healthy Lifestyles, the YMCA of Metropolitan Dallas. Martha Everson Brown, Central Dallas Outreach. Good morning, Commissioners. Karen Pettis, UNT Health Science Center Project Manager for this project. <coughs> Hello, I'm Camille Lafayette, UNT Health Science Center. I'm one of the native educators. Good morning. I'm the lady educator. Good morning. I'm Angela Williams, and I'm the project coordinator for this program. Kimberly 
So you can see that uh, we have lots of uh, wonderful institutions working with us. Uh, as you pointed out, uh, Commissioner Price, our, our approach is what we call community-based participatory uh, research or service. Uh, that means we are in the community, we're going to stay in the community, we work in the community. We do not come, uh, as academic institutions have been known to do, collect data and go away. We are there in the community, we will stay in the community and continue to work on the issues that the community raises as important. And this is certainly one that, that they saw as uh, dramatically important. So thank you. And uh, in conclusion, I know you're working on this, uh, but my colleague uh, to the uh, lower level, me over here, as we talk about the disparities in the Hispanic community, uh, they definitely need to be a part of this collaboration. Well, we're in a Spanish preferred only class at the West Dallas Multi Purpose Center planned after the first of the year. Yes, now we're addressing it. Yeah, if you want to educate and you want to uh, be part of the prevention as well, you know, we have to be sure that everybody is included. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Collins. Um, it's a pleasure for me to uh, read a resolution for someone that worked uh, in the Road and Bridge uh, office district for, for many years. Uh, uh, Ms. Linda Baker and her family and our office are here today. Um, as she retired, I wanted to thank her publicly about her hard work. I know that when I got elected, Ms. Baker was the only person that really knew where everything was in my office. So it was very appreciated. And the resolution reads as follows. Whereas Linda Baker began her employment with Dallas County in January 1994 as a core processing clerk three with the district clerk's office and then transferred to Grand Prairie Justice of the Peace Prison Six office as a JP clerk two. In February 1997, she transferred to the Lancaster Justice of the Peace Prison Five, place two, as JP clerk four, bookkeeper. Then in October of 1998, Ms. Baker was promoted to senior bookkeeper. In July 1999, she transferred to Roland Bridge District Court to become senior secretary and retired from that position in May of 2013. And whereas before Ms. Baker began her career with Dallas County, she was employed at Dallas Baptist University, a Whitefield Law Office in Denison, Texas, the County District Clerk Office in Delta County, Texas, and the Army Air Force Exchange Service in that. And whereas, Ms. Baker graduated from Duncanville High School in 1969, attended classes at Dallas Baptist University and Mountain View College, assisted her husband, Jimmy Baker, to get his bachelor's degree in religion from Dallas Baptist University in 1972, and proudly received her PhD, which I asked what it was, putting my husband to school from <laughs> Southern <laughs> University in 1986, when her husband received his master's degree in religious education. And whereas, she worked with her husband as he pastored seven Southern Baptist churches in Texas, and he worked as a special education teacher in Dallas before becoming disabled. And whereas, they have three children, Jennifer Kitchens, Andy Baker, and Julie Kitchens, and nine grandchildren. Linda and Jimmy will be celebrating her their 44th wedding anniversary on November 14th. And whereas after 19 years with Dallas County, she retired to take care of her husband due to his health and to become a full-time grandmother. Now therefore, be resolved that the Dallas County Commissioner's Court heard you commend and extend our deepest gratitude to Ms. Linda Baker for over 19 years of service to the citizens of Dallas County and wishes Ms. Baker good health and happiness. And, and I see you. All those in favor. Aye. All those in favor. Ms. Baker. I'm not retired, but we just work full time now with grandkids and my husband. 
fully developed. Okay, fully. You're not certain that it's going to be fully charged and built up. Once all of this stuff is done, so how do we, there's no way we can work to deal with this. Are they, are they taking just Dallas County information or are they taking the entire state? DPS is database. They're taking the entire uh, state database from uh, DPS. Botech is working on that, trying to pull out Dallas County data specifically. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. I just want to commend uh, this Tony Pool for being proactive and doing whatever Dallas County can do to ensure that we're sent back. The, the vote of Dallas County residents is protected and they're being able to be aware, first of all, that there's an issue with the, their ability to comply with the voter ID uh, law that has been passed. And your ability to then match up and identify those people and get information directly to them is very, very much appreciated, not only, I'm sure, by those individuals, uh, and, and we don't know at this time how many there are, but uh, yeah, significant uh, voting population in, in Dallas County. So your creativity is very, very much appreciated and your ability to, to kind of uh, work with the state agencies to encourage them to do the right thing. And more importantly, we know you've been working <laughs> tirelessly tire you know, yes. over the weekend since we thought that they were, we were going to have DPS here tomorrow. And uh, well, they've only delayed it one day. Oh, so, so it's not Thursday? So it's going like Thursday um, uh, morning. I also want to thank your staff and of course Mr. Warren. You know, John Warren that has come out to the table, you know, see how he can help us with this process to make it a one-stop shop. And hopefully we can give those. And I think if uh, the other commissioners know that what we're trying to do is uh, the DPS office will be in Dallas County um, uh, making it available at, at locations that Dallas County would like the DPS office to be there to give out the free election ID. Not only will we you roll that out to us immediately. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. You roll okay, but we're, we're also going to have uh, people there for the uh, birth certificate. I don't think you know about that. <gasps> Well, um, one thing I know, uh, Mr. Warren was trying to work that, but but did, did he get access to the city of Dallas database? Uh, because I have not seen that. And see, that what all these zip codes I, I saw with my mom and them packed in my district. These folks, this is city of the city of Dallas database is where I'm where I'm concerned. So I, you know, I, he he's got county there. And the last time I checked, he didn't have access to city of Dallas. But maybe. Maybe he's done something. He also has access to state records. Yes, actually, I have access yes. to all, all, all the records. So he's yeah, the abstract. He has the abstract versus the abstract birth certificate. <coughs> I have access to all the records across the state. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The communication with the state agencies uh, is very good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Y
Yeah, they want they want to create that documentation which will include the uh, the birth certificate. So, so it goes to DPS, they keep it? Yes. Okay. That's what I mean, it's kind of like uh, okay. like Commissioner Garcia said, one stop shop. They stop with us where they get the birth certificate, pass it to the next desk, and then on to uh, the other. Okay. I understand. Are they able to put it together? And um, we wouldn't have any once again, everybody working together, teamwork, we can, we can make these things happen. Yeah. Thank you very much. Let's do the last 24 hours, right? <laughs> <laughs> one more question on our quarter or right? A1. Before we get to A1, I want to put a couple of comments on, on, on the one that we just uh, did. On the, the uh, uh, day that the, the lawsuit came down from the Supreme Court, uh, starting out section four and building out the rights act which effectively makes section five uh, unworkable. I call this business tool and ask um, what information, how fast we get the information and bump our list against the uh, DPS list so that we can warn our voters uh, whose right to vote is going to be suppressed by this uh, law. Uh, we encountered a lot of resistance um, in trying to get that information. We uh, worked uh, hard on that. Um, and whether it's from the filing of lawsuits or from the change of heart of the leaders of the state deciding that they uh, want to be somewhat helpful in allowing people to get the uh, documentation they need so they can exercise their right to vote, um, I'm pleased that uh, people will be able to get um, this documentation. Um, and then we'll be able to uh, bump those lists. So, um, you know, I want to give, uh, uh, I want to thank our, our state leaders. I won't speculate on their motivations uh, for making uh, this um, step in the right direction. Uh, another step <coughs> in the right direction would be for them to adopt the same um, rules that uh, other states who've implemented voter ID and adopted <coughs> to allow county election departments to issue IDs and to partner uh, with retail outlets like Walmart um, and other places that people frequent so they can get the documents that they need. Uh, I'm pleased that they've taken the tiny step that they've taken and there are other steps that they can take to lessen the impact of uh, this uh, law that will have Disproportionate effect on suppressing the rights of African American and Latino voters. In your opinion? Uh, in my opinion, and in the opinion of the uh, George W. Bush appointed uh, federal court in uh, Washington, D.C., that looked at this, and uh, the experts in Attorney General Abbott's uh, office that he hired in that case a year ago. Right. And that's why I asked Mr. Pippen's pool with regards to those numbers. I want to, we want to see those numbers, and I'm sure that the court is going to want to see those numbers also. So I'm sure you're going to copy them <coughs> very well. Judge on court order A1, I did have some questions for the attorney's office with regards to. I believe she has a friendly amendment, but she, she has a suggested amendment, and I'll, I'll make it, or, or, or somebody can. You want to read your amendment? Would you like to go ahead and do that first? Or yeah, because he doesn't know what he's Yes, sir. What you're okay. Wait, wait, wait. We did the same song and dance last week. When when we got here, we didn't have, we didn't have, well, this is what's going to be voted with. What? It's kind of no it's, I know, but it's the same thing, Judge. The reason why I didn't pass last time is because when the court voted on it, it, we didn't have the amendment. So. Yes, yes, sir, Commissioner Cantrell, and, and, you and I got with you on Monday. Yes, sir. You you make a you make a very valid point, and unfortunately, I'm stuck in um, having uh, you know trying to think through all of the the different uh, things that might arise, and so um, this is another clarifying point. Strictly, it is not substantive in nature. Um, at all, or not intended to be perceived as substantive in nature. On paragraph three, in the subsection after 100%, which has a description of what happens with the attorney's fees, expenses, and costs, 
after uh, the last word in the uh, the uh, intended uh, indented language there. There would be a period, and then the following verbiage would be added. Any reimbursement for cost incurred and paid by Dallas County shall be paid to and deposited in the general funds of Dallas County. So that it is clear that um, the 275000 when and if Dallas County uh, prevails in this matter and a federal judge awards cost, that that money does in fact come back to Dallas County and it does in fact go into the general funds of the county. So that is strictly, again, clarifying language, not intended to be substantive. And I do apologize, Commissioner uh, Cantrell, because you make a very valid uh, point and, and have a valid complaint. And I caught that. It was based on your concern. Right. Okay. Right. Okay, so let's go to the item number five. So I'll need a motion somewhere. <laughs> right. no problem. If the point is appropriate, I just want to make sure that we're clear on the procedure. The maker, the maker, the maker accepts uh, that language. Can I say that? And, and just, to be, just to clarify, that language only deals with expense. Correct. Right. Yes, sir. That would be the method by which the reimbursement would come back to the house. <clears throat> Strictly for expenses. Yes, sir. So, on um, uh, paragraph number five. Yes, sir. When <clears throat> last week, when I asked my question with regards to Mr. Watkins or his representatives with regards to currency, mm -hmm. my question was: since he is, since Mr. Watkins is as an associate co-counsel, that when the attorney's fees are divided amongst the attorneys that are participating in this lawsuit. If the plaintiffs prevail, I wanted the attorney's fees awarded or divided amongst Mr. Watkins to Mr. Watkins for his representatives to come back to the county to the general fund. The way that you drafted number five, you have cut Mr. Watkins out of all attorney's fees. In other words, it's kind of ironic that Dallas County is the only one in this lawsuit that, that's paying for attorney's fees. And we're the only ones in the lawsuit, if the clients prevail, that the taxpayers won't be reimbursed. No, we're paying for attorney's fees. All the time that, that his office spends on this case, oh. mm -hmm. the taxpayers are paying for it. But, but his office, so what, 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 what is it? If, well, no, they're, they're going, they're <coughs> tracking down and going to the hearings and different things like that. <coughs> okay. As a clarifying point, we're, we're not paying attorney's fees to private counsel. We are paying salary to myself and whoever in the civil division works on this case. A salary that I would receive regardless of what I am working on for the county. And it just means that instead of doing 60 hours a week, I'm going to be doing 75 hours a week and I'm not going to be receiving additional salary, but you make a very valid point. And, but let me explain to you, sir. That isn't what was contemplated initially, and from a practical perspective, when we prevail and the judge looks at um, how attorney's fees are going to be dispersed, the judge isn't going to allow five attorneys to get um, reimbursement of their attorney's fees for uh, attending a deposition or attending a hearing or whatever. The judge is going to look at the complete <coughs> counsel, who is uh, the person that uh, had primary responsibility for this, and that is the attorney that is going to be given the attorney's fees. So while we will be doing significant, important work in this case, it's been contemplated that our lead counsel will always be present at depositions and hearings, and it was contemplated and expected that he would be the person that would receive the reimbursement from the judge, because the judge isn't going to say three, four attorneys, you get to all charge attorney's fees related to this one function. That time, I, I yes, appreciate sir. all of that. Uh, the maker will win paragraph five so that if the judge, any attorney fees, uh, come back go to the general fund. We can certainly do that. And if, if I end up, for example, going to a deposition being lead counsel and the judge awards, that would be appropriate. Can I 
All right. So I'm drawing up a proposed sentence for you. Okay. And then one, one other question as well. Question on Judge Stroud. <laughs> you know, it's anticipated. The plaintiffs anticipate that they will prevail on this lawsuit. And based on statutory language, they, they would be entitled to attorney's fees. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Section 42, 1988 provides for attorney's fees. Okay. And I also ask you to look at what liability does Dallas County have if the plaintiffs are not successful and the defendants are successful? Yes, sir. And I just want to get that on the record. Yes. What your response to me? I didn't get it in writing, so I want to get it on right. the record. There is United States Supreme Court president, president um, on this um, specific issue, sir. And basically, defendants are held to a different standard. For defendants to receive attorney's fees under 42 U.S. 1988, under this case, they would basically <coughs> have to show that the plaintiff's action was frivolous, unreasonable, or without foundation. So, um, in this case, <coughs> if we were, Dallas County were not to prevail, and the defendants came in and said, Judge, give us attorney's fees as a result of this. Dallas County can prevail. The standard that the judge would use is to determine whether or not, in fact, the action was frivolous, unreasonable, or without foundation that was defended by the defendants. And in this case, I believe it is highly unlikely, um, extremely unlikely, that any award of attorney's fees would be made against Dallas County to the defendants. And if there was an award, it would be jointly and separate liable. In other words, if we're the only ones with deep pockets, could, if the attorney's fees were awarded, would we be the one that pays the whole bill? I don't believe that that's the case, and it's just not, it's not going to, I don't say never, because um, I don't believe in saying never, but this is about as close as, as getting to never as I would get. It, it's just not <coughs> something that can reasonably be contemplated as a situation that Dallas County will find itself in. I just want to get that on the record. Yes, sir. And um, that's it. while we're trying to get the language, A2 under the, uh, you mentioned, you tell me, A2 under the, uh, the syndicate is as we have stated. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. On, the, on the record.
Yeah, I'm okay. If you want to get it, if they say go sit a 20 hour deposition and grab a witness, have your investigators just talk to these people, get in the writing. That's all I'm saying. What you're saying before any work's done. Before the, before before the work that you're going to bill for is done, uh, get it in the writing. I guess we Yes, and, and in my conversations with Mr. Dunn, I believe that that's acceptable. If it's what's contemplated, if we end up sitting in a being lead because his plane is stuck in Houston or something like that. It would be. It was contemplated that we would receive um, reimbursement. That that was something that was not really contemplated as being something that would go on uh, on significant occasions. Let let the maker accept the language that we want to And I second. And Okay. And that's not call the question. Okay. Uh, and I'll add one other thing just because of well, what you mentioned. Um, after the words um, um, in the writing, I'll, I'll, I would add to that to the extent practical. So in the event that somehow somebody's planning to end up and they say, Teresa, can you go handle it? And if they can't email you or whatever, uh, you know, y'all can do it after the fact. That be acceptable to everyone? All those in favor? Aye. Show me voting no on A1. So and then, yes, I know. So, so uh, Mr. Cantrell, no on A1 and yes on all of their work. A1? No. In this case, it's to our uh, group agenda. We are. Okay. And, and we are very honored to have them uh, back with us today, our uh, county administrator. Thank you. And Senator West, uh, if you're leaving, do you have any uh, comments or anything? Uh, well, just, just want to well. comment uh, again, pharmacists, too. I just want to make certain sure it's clear that uh, it's, it's a joint effort between Dallas and Fort Worth. Probably the first time in higher education, both communities have come together. And we will have a pharmacist school at UNT Dallas. I just want to make certain that's clear. Yeah. All right. I think we would need one with that. But yes, sir. I want to put that on the record. Okay. <laughs> 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 Item 1, Juvenile 1A, recommends approval of extension of fiscal year 2012 2013, Bureau of Fund Allocations through December 31 of 2013. <laughs> Item B, recommends approval of youth service advisory board allocations for fiscal year 2014. Item C, recommends approval of request and amend the residential services contract with Brookhaven and Youth Branch to include intensive level services. Item D, recommend the full second of the four additional one year goals of an interlocal agreement with the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. Item E, recommend the full of the Juvenile Department's continued participation in the JDAI project sponsored by the ADE Casey Foundation. It's also recommend the Commission to court approve the special services contract with Dr. Renee Walker and the of these projects. Item F, recommend the Commissioner's Court approve the Jewel Department's recommendation to reimburse My Girls Inc. the amount of $1,800 for services rendered in fiscal year 2013. And item G, recommends the Commissioner's Court approve compensation of $15,000 to the Dallas County Department Substance Abuse Unit by Cardia Services for additional programming and training. Dr. C, do you have a question on that? My question is for answer. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Uh, I really appreciate it. The response and the analysis that I got. So, I'm only thinking all this was approved by the Dallas County. Right. The board. Yeah. But I mean, sometimes I get the minutes and some of my stuff changed, but those details get lost sometimes, and I really appreciate, you know, the detail of the response that you gave. I don't know, write down, do an I have two sharp, uh, two A request approval of acquisition of an MRAP four-wheel tactical vehicle. 
for the Warrant Execution Division and add the MRAP to the Dallas County Sheriff Fleet Inventory, Dr. Daniel? I respect the resourcefulness of the Sheriff's Department and all that they do. How will this vehicle be used? I'm sorry. How will this vehicle be used? It will be used in any active shooter situation. Um, as you know, we have one of the largest uh, warrant squads in Texas, and uh, we always try to find ways to protect our officers when they're approaching an unknown situation. There are times when we do know that the situation is going to be extremely dangerous and we want to uh, provide added protection for our officers. Uh, an active shooter situation, thank goodness, Dallas has never had one, Dallas County has never had one, but in an active shooter situation, the armed vehicle, especially if one of our officers is hurt, will be used to uh, assist the person in getting out of the situation. The armor vehicle will block the shooting and bring that. Well, thank you so much for that. I'm sorry. Thank you for being proactive and using the resources, recognizing the resources when we see them. That's a $600,000 people that we obtain for free. Thank you very much. You're going to service it out of your regular food. I'm sorry? You're going to service it out of your regular food. That is correct, sir. It's a diesel engine. We are going hunting in it, correct? We hope not. I certainly hope not. I have a fee recommended school for interlocal agreement with Pat Stop of Sheriff's Palm to provide enforcement service for a HOV survey HOV made in Dallas County. I'm free election that quote is on the formal agenda. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I, I, then I, I, I saw the chief of the people. Yeah, the sheriff. Uh, Y'all told me, uh, what is he doing? No, what I wasn't thinking, I saw the gas, you know, all chained every 5,000 miles, so I'm not to show it or something. Look, it shouldn't get that many miles. I mean, there shouldn't be very many miles for what I'm Yeah, man. Yeah. But, what, what is the real cost? Services. I'm sorry? Half a million dollars a year. What's, what's the real cost of the services? We don't anticipate the initial services because this vehicle has only seen many goods at this point for the brand new vehicle. Okay. So therefore, we only use it in extreme uh, emergency situations. So we don't anticipate the additional services outside of the change of law at this point. It is when you drive that so it stays. Yes, yeah. yeah, of course. I'm on the HOB <coughs> enforcement. Um, we have the personal share. We're ready to uh, go ahead and take that additional deal. Yes, ma'am. I saw that. Uh, that's uh, Julie. Yeah, you remember the Texas Department of Health and That's a million. 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 Yes, ma'am. What we're going to do is we're going to use the officers that we already have. We have been. Um, doing traffic enforcement in that area. We're going to take four officers and one sergeant to use in, a, in, in an area which we're already uh, servicing. Um, the good thing about it right now is that only half of the actual area that we will eventually be servicing is under construction. So the four officers will be able to cover the area that is not under construction right now. It will be another year or so before that, uh, well, that comes on. Well, you know, if, if, you know we're, back, we're back talking about Class C's. Uh, and I know where, they, uh, you know, I've looked and see, I've seen where these, uh, you know, these lanes off like a, you know, four miles, two miles, uh, uh, camp with them, back and forth, and then the, uh, have, have, we, have we contacted uh, those, those courts? And the cities, the cities have been contacted in all of those areas, and the cities in the HOV lane will be covering the accidents. Now, are you talking about the tickets? Yes. 
Um, I'm talking about the Tickets will be filed in the JP courts. Currently, DARP, when they were doing that, those tickets were being filed in the JP courts. So it should not be a substantial workload in the JP courts. But there may be more enforcement. There, there should be more enforcement. And there, there might be more tickets, but it's not going to be a substantial. I don't anticipate it being a, a workload issue in the JP courts. And that was my question, because obviously, um, you know, Sheriff, you've done a fantastic job, and as someone that served the city of Dallas, we always, you know, comment uh, what a fantastic job the Sheriff does in the sun when it comes to, you know, traffic and enforcement and the fact is so uh, how fast you can do it faster than the police department or the fire department. So just wanted to be sure that you continue that quality of care after the quality. Yes, care. we're we're gonna use existing officers to pull for them and a sergeant would use those to pull over. Of course, the new rookies are coming in behind, but those are not the ones that we're using for that enforcement. Yeah, yeah, those they are, and those uh, are coming in behind to fill I know we got a chief, uh, and I see got a new captain in reserve. But look, what we need to ask is, um, do we have a comfort level with regards to the numbers I tell you? I know we're going to hear this, and I don't see them having been copied any part of this. I don't know how much went away as a result of what God did. I don't know what we anticipate coming back. As, I, as you said, I see a different enforcement module with the Sheriff's Department. And I saw with God. What were they doing? How were they doing? I, mean, I didn't see that as a part. Of it. We will certainly monitor the activities as it relates to these tickets being followed in JP courts. So if it doesn't warrant that we need to address staffing issues. The JP courts is obviously they're decreasing their take number of tickets filed and then therefore their staff has been decreasing over the, the last couple of years. And so this should allow us to kind of stabilize some of the JP courts at, at, at a certain level. But I will want to I can't tell you. I don't anticipate it being an issue. This this is a little bit of background. This this is I think this is a win win uh, for the the uh, county and for the state. So uh, the, the genesis of this all began with uh, with the uh, realistic and very real problem that sheriff's traffic um, uh, was what well, is not a core function but was losing money. So we looked for a way to shore that up and make sure that that uh, important service uh, remained. And we went to our various partners, um, the uh, uh, COG and the City of Dallas, and we said, "Look, we're doing these core, uh, these non-core responsibilities." that we're losing money at, um, at your request, you need to pay your fair share. Um, and they did that. But we're trying to look at a way to, to uh, uh, because we know Sheriff's Traffic is doing, uh, does a three times better job than the city of Dallas was doing at clearing ranks. Uh, and it's, it's believed by COG, and the people are looking at that, that Sheriff's Traffic out there is saving lives and increasing traffic flow so you can get from point A to point B faster. So uh, at a dinner a couple of years ago in Arlington with all of the veterans, uh, Mr. Meadows was on the, the uh, uh, DOT board. Um, we discussed their desire to take over uh, the HOV lanes from DART and our desire for them to do more to help us with sheriff's traffic. From that was born the idea that sheriff's traffic would do this. And it's been built in such a way we may have gotten the model wrong. I think we did though, but it was built in such a way that we, we, uh, it's supposed to be um, it was supposed to be a bit of a cushion in it, and it's at best revenue or it's a worst revenue neutral for us, so that it allows uh, you know, sheriff's traffic um, to, to be out there doing the great things that they're doing, and it's a testament to the great job that uh, sheriff's traffic and sheriff Fowler are doing that among all the entities in the state that. That they can partner with to handle these roads. The one they want to partner with is the Dallas County Sheriff's Department. So, 32 miles south of 30 and 36 miles north of 30. And you look at that side. I just want you to know none of the calculations. 32 south, 36 north. And that was part of the concern. Right, yeah. And, and, uh, is the concern the, the month uh, 
because we we can go back to text uh, and address that. But is the concern that you're afraid that we're going to lose money on this deal? There's a concern. Well, let me that just tell you, and, and of course, often in matter models, we don't make money on the DVD. <laughs> we just want to get trying to look at uh, right. We don't. We don't make money. We're talking about breaking even. We're building models so that we can break even. We're working right. Uh, so, well, you know, it's um, good. This this office has been great. Uh, a lot of that traffic management. That has not been the case. You sit down and do the budgeting. Am I correct, Mr. Director? Yes. Okay. We are not. We are not involved either. And so that's that's fine. I'm not taking on other duties under the guise of public safety and, and traffic management. And I realize what a great job they've done and they, they've proven that. It's just that at the end of the day, while well, we talk about being pushing and being able to break, break, that's not been the case. But I'm primarily, that when they get into their post there, they're not correct. Correct? correct. But he said that possibly. The model here does not include any slash S. Yeah. I said, no, I don't. <laughs> that, that, is, that is a positive and when you look at it. And the reason that we're going to set this up as a grant so that we can monitor the actual cost. And additionally, I'm going to monitor that they're not utilizing additional resources to try to maintain the needs of the contract and not get the reimbursed. And, and, and Chisula, I, I know you and your leadership, you're, 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 you're doing a great job. There's no reflection. I just, you know, I just have some concerns because, you know, I, I was wrong when we had the collection center. And <clears throat> seemed to be doing fairly well. And at that time, the commission's court decided to disassemble. Is that how much you read? You are correct. And, 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 and we have not gotten back to that level of collection since. Uh, I know people want to want to fathom that that we got there. We we're not back there. And so all I'm saying in this area, and I know we regardless of the perception, you know, class and traffic citation, excuse me, don't make money. I just so we not give it. It's about enforcement. It's about safety, public safety. You buy into it for all the models. But air quality. Sorry. Air quality. Yeah, air quality. quality. So, but, but at the end of the day, you know, we pay for it. I don't think we've ever said that. No, 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 no. Property. No, Chef, this is no reflection on you. I just, you know, everybody's uh, talking about, you know, how everybody just wants want the record to be recorded. Well, and as far as why we have so much trouble, there's several variables as to why we have trouble with class. These are, there are people that can't pay those, that absolutely can't pay the ticket. But there are also um, JPs and judges um, who reduce those tickets to uh, very minor amounts. And in rare circumstances, uh, that's warranted. Uh, but the cost of that, there's a human cost of that. And the human cost of that is if you make it to where uh, we, we are spending millions and millions of dollars more than we're bringing in on sheriff's traffic, then we can't patrol the, the roads to the extent we could if uh, people would collect the money. And you know, beyond that, just uh, you know, they're probably too nice to say it. I'm from a family with law enforcement in that. Um, from a law enforcement perspective, when people are risking their lives standing on the side of the road while people whiz by them, you know, going 65 miles an hour, and then you show up for um, the hearing to have the ticket either dismissed or somebody pay like a dollar. Um, yeah, it's kind of slap in the face to uh, um, uh, people out there risking their lives every day on the road. So I think that that's a, a, a nut to crack. But here in Dallas County, we have an independent um, elected judiciary. We have to respect their opinions. I hope when they're making those decisions, they'll keep in mind the incredible work that our officers do and the fact that um, our officers are, are risking a lot when people break the law, they are in the Thank you. Thank you, sir. I have a few lectures that quote was on the formal agenda. I have four purchasing, four Asian annual contract extensions, four B, first department of the department of the Dallas County Health and Services record approval of the lease of the attached RFP for ground mosquito spray authorizing person to follow the advertised designation of the quote of the chairman as well. Mr. Marvin, yes, sir. Mr. Tom, I, I, I asked um, yesterday, I generated, I think the court received 
uh, with regards to the government, the government shutdown. Um, does it have any impact on any of uh, your services or our services in Dallas County? Uh, I, I did get um, a um, memo from uh, the Office of Federal Assistant Management, HHS, uh, with regards to uh, program payments. Well, at this point, Dallas County Health and Services have been notified of any impact that Dallas will have on us. Of course, what we have to consider is how long the shutdown will occur. If indeed you go into the end of the month, into November, that could have an impact on the federal dollars that come into the state that are then dispersed to Dallas County. But at this point, we have not been notified of any impact on our program. But again, we don't know the long-term effect and how long the shutdown will occur. This could all change if it goes longer than what most people expect. Because you're current right now with your grant allocations. I would prefer at this point, we've received our allocation. I only have maybe one grant that has two people on it that's direct funding from the CDC. That's around 250000 but we don't have it on the $100 million operation. So, in terms of that, uh, we don't have an impact at this point. But again, what I want to clarify, if it goes longer in terms of the federal shutdown, then the allocations that have been committed will probably be relooked. And so in terms of how they disperse that funding. One example would be we received our allocation, as I pointed out on this question, that HUD had uh, delayed payments to landlords to the seventh of this month. We will receive that allocation, hopefully on the second. And then we don't know what the November allocation will be because if the, if the shutdown continues, that will possibly impact the allocation for the month of November. But again, the great question is currently no impact. If it's long term, it would have no impact. Because uh, they're continuing, um, like the CBDG funds and HUD funds and uh, HIV, are all those? Well, we've been notified by <coughs> the document, we've been notified from personal that that would not have any impact uh, as of yet on the personal, which is our runway funding. But that's why I want to clarify at this point, short term impact, no. It goes into talking about November billing and reimbursement. That's where that's, this whole conversation will change in three weeks. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Item C, President Park, recommending the court recommend the court approve discretionary exemption to competitive procurement process to allow the Institute of Forensic Sciences to uh, acquire robotic liquid handling workstations for the DNA sample processing from Perkin Elmer Incorporated. Item 5, Public Works, 5A, recommends the execution of the Cooperative Data Program Participation Agreement between the County and North Texas Central Council of Governments, in order to continue participation in, in that program. Item D, recommends the Commission put accept the offer of purpose agreement to tax the full property of 319 with Haven Boulevard in Duncanville, authorize sell the property by a quick claim deed, authorize the tax assessor collector to receive the disperse proceeds in accordance with property tax code. I have received the same for 940 Pine Tree Lane in Southern Texas. Let, let, me just, let me just say to you. Uh, okay. Yeah, that's what I'm like, looking for. Pam and uh, the city. Right I, I did a calculation. Um, <clears throat> Y'all have, you, with your efforts later, you put more than a million dollars worth of foreclosed property back on the road. I just want to say thank you. Uh, I know probably if my other colleagues probably asked query on some of the same questions, what percentage of CAD value are we bringing back? But you, you've placed, since we started this initiative, over a million dollars worth of property back on the road. And that's, that's commendable. These are properties that have basically been out there Lucy value, unloaded, vacated. We, we, don't, we no longer have to maintain them, et cetera. So uh, thanks to both of you, thanks to Public Works for that. In addition, Judge, uh, 
Mr. Ain uh, would have us know that he has set a, a collection of a record again uh, with regards to his, his office. He, re he received uh, over $400,000 in additional uh, revenue. So if the 2012 taxes have been collected uh, <coughs> at the 2008 tax year collection rate of 98%, uh, we would have lost $2.69 million in the current revenue year. So uh, that, that he set another record and I commend uh, his office as well. I know, just wanted to ask because um, you just say the amount of money that public works has to back into you know, our general fund, that is fantastic. And it's most of it is not in the Dallas County. However, most of them in this district. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> Just wanted that one to be
Disruptive visitors or registered speakers may be removed or subject to the penalty provided to the state of Texas Penal Code Section 38.13, 42.01, 42.02, 42.03, 42.04, 42.05, registered individual speakers are limited to three minutes, and the maximum discussion of any one topic is limited to 30 minutes. All right, uh, first, thank you. Our uh, first speaker today is Mr. Alton L. Uh, Colby Jr. Um, sir, Mr. Colby, you please just take your name and your name. Please just finish your discussion for all speakers. Please uh, finish your, your uh, sentence and your thought at that time. And don't go on to a new idea. Thank, thank you, sir. Go ahead. Hello. My name is Alton L. Colpine, Jr. I reside at 2255, North Washington Avenue, Dallas, Texas, 75204. I'm a resident of District 3. I'm here specifically or court order from the 265th District Court of Dallas County, Texas. I will be brief. I am a state professional, I'm a sole practitioner registered in the County of Dallas, and my husband here also started today. Mr. Staff, I have a copy of my letter to the University of Rhode Island. Mr. Colvin, I'm, I'm going to ask you to speak up, project a little bit more so that you can hear. Or just pull the microphone closer. Commissioner staff, with the exception of Dr. Daniel, have a copy of my letter dated today to an assistant Dallas County District Attorney concerning a pro se judgment granted by <coughs> the 265th District Court of Dallas County. I'll read in part only one small paragraph. Certificate of compliance signed by the Assistant Dallas County District Attorney stated, the Side Attorney has forwarded a copy of the order to each such agency and request that said agency comply with the order and forward any records directly to this court. Close quote. One of the respondents listed did not respond. I'm here only to ask. County Commissioner's Court provide what moral and good support may be appropriate to the Assistant District Attorney of the County of Dallas to obtain compliance with that particular court order. Thank you for your time. Have a good day. I'll discuss this and we'll make it. So we don't have any uh, questions. It's your opportunity to speak. Uh, I do want to uh, tell you this, to the extent that you are affected by a court order, um, this is not the Court of Appeals for, for any court. Uh, there are valuable timeline limits and, and timelines in, in appealing or moving to set aside court orders. Um, you should avail yourself to the, the pertinent laws that are dealing with your case or seek an attorney of your choice. With respect, Judge Jenkins, the action is brought on a pro se basis. I don't have to be an attorney to write an opinion. I'm here only to ask the Commissioner's Court to support their own employee in their efforts to obtain compliance with court order signed by a county judge. Thank you, sir. Any other questions? Thank you very much for your time. Our next speaker is thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. Richard Sheridan. Good morning, my name is Richard Sheridan, 30224 Sunny Dallas, Texas. We're one month and twenty-one days. Um, in the memory of President John F. Kennedy. I'm here to speak about JFK, RFK, Jr., and the unspeakable truths. 
Dallas was called the city of Nate at the time of JFK assassination. Today, Dallas is, by some people, called the city that hates the truth. And it's unfortunate that a handful of city leaders make the rest of us look bad to the nation. But especially the truth from the book JFK, RFK Jr., discussed in Dallas during the secret Charlie Rose interview that occurred on January 11th of this year. The book, JFK and the Unspeakable, Why He Died and Why It Matters. <coughs> the author, James Douglas, 76 years old, born in 1937, American author, activist, and Christian theologian. He was a public address announcer for the New York Mets from 1988 to 1993. Co-founder of Religious Leaders for 9-11 Truth. He wrote the book JFK and the Unspeakable in 2008, which is now in paperback for about $12. A real deal. In this great book, Douglas presents the JFK assassination as a conspiracy carried out by the CIA with the help of the mafia and the elements of the FBI to put an end to Kennedy's effort to end the war. This is other material about Mr. Douglas, which you can read later. Here's what some had to say about the book. I'm quoting Yoko Ono, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., and all of us now. Right now, I ask all of you, please, please read JFK and the Unspeakable. I cried all night reading it and didn't sleep a wink. It is a book that can make us stand up and change the world right now. Maybe we can save the world before it blows up. Really, end quote, Yoko Ono. Second quote, in JFK and the unspeakable Jim Douglas has distilled all the best available research into a very well documented and convincing portrait of President Kennedy's transforming turn to peace at the cost of his life. Personally, it made a very big impact on me. After reading it in Dallas, I was moved for the first time to visit Dilly Plaza. I urge all Americans to read this book and come to their own conclusions about why he died and why, after 50 years, it still matters. That was Robert F. Kennedy Jr. And lastly, Oliver Stone, who most of us know, filmed JFK about 20 years ago. This is his book review. The murder of President Kennedy was a seminal event for me and for millions of Americans. It changed the course of history. It was a crushing blow to our country and to millions of people around the world. It put an abrupt end to a period of misunderstood idealism, akin to the spirit of 1989, when Soviet bloc began to thaw, and 2008, when our new president was failed and elected. Today, more than 45 years later, profound, profound doubts persist about how President Kennedy was killed and why. My film was a metaphor for all those doubts and suspicions. Basically, they all encourage us to read the book and speak on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shish. Our next speaker is Ms. Ecoria of uh, London. Hello, Ecoria London, 1870. <coughs> okay, I'm here today because last year in February, well, no, this year in February, my daughter was injured. I mean, she got a hand fracture, which is a broken bone, by some DIA personnel. And to this day, they're still there. You know, she's on a safety transfer to another school. And the point is, CPS has turned their back on us two times in a row. And I'm looking at the news, and, and a kid had to get killed before some CPS workers get prosecuted. And I feel that. The, the CPS workers that turned their back on us, I need, I need them to be investigated. You know, because they show up and then they leave and then they say, oh, we're going to close the case. But when somebody injure our kid, you know, it's not a big deal because if we injure our kid, we go to jail. And it needs to be the same thing. You know, if somebody in the, in the district hurt our kids, they need to be prosecuted, you know? And CPS can't keep turning their back on, on, on our kids. Because that means they're not protecting the children. <clears throat> they say they, they protect children, so protect them. I don't want them around my family. They need to quit bugging us. Don't even come around our family if you're going to turn your back like, like they did on us. Because they came to my kids' school. And I guess they're going to reopen the case finally, but I had to call Eddie Bernice. I, I mean, I had to call everybody. I called all these senators. I done went international, international with it. I done called people that I went to school with. 
and say, can you help me? You know, I got people all the way in Boston trying to help me instead of people in Texas. And I just want some justice for my child. They are going to broke her hand, you know. And she do play sports, and they say it will be re-injured again. So they need to take care of her and the medical bills and everything. But it doesn't make any sense that, I mean, I'm here because my landlord, she tried to use the CPS thing like I'm scared of CPS. I'm not afraid of them. I'm not going to ever be afraid of them because I know they can turn their back on children. I've seen it twice. 2010, my daughter had a sh slight stroke on that 88 feet medicine. They, everybody ran away. Metro Fair ran away. CPS ran away. The school, they said it ain't my fault. But they thought that's what she needed. I mean, school is not an obedience camp. That's what they're trying to make it into. You know, just teach the kids. That's all I'm asking for the kids to be taught something. Educate our kids. I mean, I have three degrees. I ain't never really had a job with a substitute teacher for 12 years. And I just stayed there trying to help these kids. Then my daughter gets in, and then I was fired last year <coughs> for speaking, speaking out. Plus, somebody tried to burn my car. And I don't know. understand that. Yeah, Is there anyone I can speak to, you know, after this? This thing's over? No, ma'am, when, when you, you finish your thought, um, you have a series it. of three beats that's you know, um, our last speaker is Ms. Darling. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Darling Ewing. Um, I reside at 219 Molina, Sunnyvale, Texas, in Commissioner District District. And I have been a citizen of Dallas County for 30, over 35 years, and I'm one of the thousands of Dallas County citizens without insurance. I've not had medical insurance in many years. I cannot buy insurance from a private health insurance company because I have a pre-existing condition. Now you may say, well, that makes sense. It's not health disease, it's not diabetes. I have no blood pressure issues, no pulmonary issues, no cancer issues. My pre-existing disease or condition is I'm overweight. And for 20 years, no insurance company would sell me insurance at any price. My only option was a group policy. As a, I don't think I'm a poster child for someone who doesn't have insurance. I make good money. I'm an attorney. I'm educated. I know the value of insurance, but I couldn't find it. My only option was the State Bar of Texas, which offers group health insurance to attorneys. I did that for a while until the premium approached $1,200 a month. Even for someone who works as I do, I could not afford that. More than my car payment. More than my house payment insurance. So I've not had insurance until today, October 1, with the rollout of the Affordable Health Care Act. I now can get insurance. I have insurance at the cost of around $504 per month. And it is not catastrophic insurance, which I was paying close to $1,200 a month for. It is a 70-30 policy known as a silver plan. It's not the catastrophic policy. It's not the bronze. I can get health insurance cheaper if I wanted to go with a bronze plan or a catastrophic plan. But that's something that's within my budget. And I'm aware that this commissioner's court has made many programs, rolled them out. As a, they're going to be an announcement at Parkland, I believe, an event today, this afternoon, to make other uninsured citizens of Dallas County aware of what is now available because of the Affordable Health Care Act. So not only do I want to thank my president for finally making it possible for me to get insurance, I want to thank the commissioner's court who have taken the time, the effort, and expended the resources to make every other uninsured citizen of Dallas County aware of what they now have potentially for insurance. Thank you. And Ms. Young, thank you for coming and sharing your, your story. Um, this isn't about uh, elected officials talking to people about the Affordable Care Act. It's, it's about real people. So I'll take a moment of personal privilege. Well, I'm going to take a moment of personal privilege. You need to ask the district attorney if we're going to have a debate on it. We haven't responded to any of the other speakers. You can't do that, Judge. You can't do it. I'm going to take a moment of personal privilege just to say thank you for giving us your personal story. Do that. All right, and with that, um,
that takes us to the end of our agenda. We do have some matters to discuss in closed session, so uh, recess for closed session in a moment. And the chat provided in one of the text of government that is previously spoken. Any actions as a result of the closed session will take place in the session. We will begin our closed session.